I am so glad you're here. Today, we're going to be talking all about nucleophiles and electrophiles. Specifically, we're going to look at how identifying them can allow us to predict reactivity between molecules in organic chemistry. And make sure you stick around to the end because I have some practice problems that should help for your next exam. Nucleophile is rooted in Greek, meaning lover of a nucleus. Remember that at the center of each atom, we can find all of the protons and what we call the nucleus of an atom. So all the protons are located in the nucleus of an atom. And remember that according to the law of electrostatic attraction, things that are negatively charged are going to be attracted to things that are positively charged. And remember, electrons tend to be negatively charged. Therefore, something that is willing to give up its electrons or attack using electrons is going to be a nucleophile, and specifically, it is going to attack things that are positively charged. And conversely, things that have a buildup of positive charge, we can call an electrophile because it is a lover of electrons. It wants to receive electrons from other species. So the electrophile is going to receive electrons, and the nucleophile is going to attack protons. Let's consider acetone for a second. Remember that due to the electronegativity differences between oxygen and carbon, there is a dipole where the electrons are being pulled towards the oxygen atom. In fact, in our last video, we covered resonance structures, which you can find here, and we know that we can actually draw this as a resonance structure where all of those electrons are actually pulled to the oxygen, making it negatively charged and making the carbon atom fully positively charged. However, due to this dipole, even in this resonance form, we would say that oxygen is partially negative and this carbon is partially positive and we indicate a partial charge by this lowercase delta symbol from the Greek alphabet. Therefore, we would actually say that in this acetone molecule, there is a location which is electrophilic because it wants to receive electrons because it is partially positive and a section of the molecule which is nucleophilic because it contains an abundance of electrons and it is willing to attack other nucleuses where positive charge are built up. So therefore, in fact, if we were to introduce a nucleophile to acetone, and remember nucleophiles are basically Lewis bases, which are electron donors, then we would expect a nucleophilic attack to occur at that electrophilic carbon. And these electrostatic attractions govern most of the reactions that you'll cover in organic chemistry. In fact, about 95% of all reactions that we're gonna learn about in organic chemistry come from the difference in electrostatic attractions. Because most of the reactions we're going to learn about rely on your ability to identify nucleophiles and electrophiles, I'm going to give you some tips to help you identify them. For a structure that has a localized negative charge on an oxygen atom, like for example for hydroxide, which we know is OH-, the oxygen is always going to be a very strong nucleophile. In other words, it acts as a Lewis base which is going to donate electrons. So remember, Lewis bases donate electrons and Lewis acids receive electrons. Now importantly, these structures are ions. We could have also written this out as an ionic compound like lithium hydroxide or sodium hydroxide. Remember that when these ionic compounds dissolve, they actually turn into their component ions. So lithium separates as a cation and hydroxide separates as an anion. So even if you see this ionic compound instead of just hydroxide, you should be able to identify that the hydroxide anion is actually a nucleophile. Other examples include alcohols or even water, for example. So water has the Lewis structure where oxygen has two lone pairs on it. However, remember that due to the electronegativity difference between oxygen and hydrogen, we would say that this is a polar molecule where the hydrogen is partially positive and the oxygen is partially partially negative. So even in this example, because there is a lone pair of electrons and a partially negative oxygen atom, we would say that this oxygen atom is in fact nucleophilic, and therefore it's going to attack things that are either fully positive or partially positive. Now in each of these examples, we identified oxygen or other atoms that contain actual lone pairs as being nucleophilic sites, sites that are going to be nucleophiles. And those are easy to identify because they're Lewis bases and they have lone pairs of electrons with which they can donate to other atoms. Other common examples, though, that are a little less easy to identify include alkenes. So in this case, if you had ethylene, there is a pi bond in between these two carbon atoms where we have a location of electrons which can donate to other atoms, thus making this act as a nucleophile. Remember that in this bond, when we think about the ethylene molecule acting as a nucleophile, remember that at 
the carbon-carbon double bond is where we have the overlap of two p orbitals. And those two p orbitals overlap above and below the internuclear axis, giving us a location of electron density. So if we think about this molecular orbital, it actually looks just like this, where you have a molecular orbital where one region is fully shaded and another region is fully unshaded. And therefore, this gives us a location where there's electron density that can donate to other atoms, making this a nucleophile. Turning our attention to electrophiles, oftentimes we'll find that electrophiles are electron deficient, either existing as ions or molecules that are capable of receiving electrons. In fact, we can consider most electrophiles to be Lewis acids. So Lewis acids, remember, mean that they receive or can accept electrons. So again, if you had a polarized molecule where at this carbon is attached to a fluorine atom, for example, remember that fluorine is very electronegative, meaning that there's going to be a strong dipole pulling the electron density towards fluorine. This makes fluorine partially negative and this carbon partially positive. And therefore, we would expect that this carbon would be an electrophilic site that can receive electrons because it is partially positive and electrons being partially negative or fully negative can attack at that position. Other common examples that we will encounter are actually going to be fully positive cations. So a cation is obviously a built up positive charge because at that position there is an empty p orbital which can receive electrons. So at this site there are no electrons in that orbital and we can attack with nucleophiles to donate electrons to that carbocation position. And remember we can add that to the fact that ketones or aldehydes or other carbonyl carbons also give us a partially negative charge at oxygen and a partially positive charge at that carbonyl carbon making that carbonyl carbon electrophilic and susceptible to nucleophilic attack or receiving electrons. Let's walk through an example of identifying for a single molecule all of the nucleophilic sites and all of the electrophilic sites. Since this compound has several different functional groups, we can begin by identifying the locations around those functional groups as being either nucleophilic or electrophilic. Remember that oxygen atoms that contain lone pairs of electrons are often going to be capable of acting as a nucleophile. Because there is a partially negative charge on this oxygen atom and there are electrons with which can donate to other atoms, we would consider this to be a nucleophilic site. So this is a nucleophile at this position. Similarly, this oxygen also has lone pairs of electrons and a dipole exists between the carbon and the oxygen making this oxygen partially negative. Therefore, we would also predict that this is a nucleophilic position at this oxygen atom. Now importantly, since there is this dipole where the electrons are being pulled to the oxygen atom, this means that this carbon position has a partially positive charge and it is actually an electrophilic position. So at this position, it is electrophilic. Additionally, since chlorine is the third or fourth most electronegative atom according to the Pauling scale, there's also a dipole at this position, meaning that the electrons are being pulled towards chlorine. And therefore, we would expect that at this carbon, this is actually going to be partially positive, making this also an electrophilic carbon position. Now let's try some practice problems to gauge your understanding. Pause the video, try these problems independently, and then resume the video to check my answers. You need to be able to rapidly identify whether or not molecules are going to act as nucleophiles or electrophiles. Beginning with these examples, we can see that in this alkyl halide, there is likely to be a partially positive carbon position between the carbon and the bromine atom. Therefore, we would expect that this molecule would be an electrophile. So an electrophilic carbon exists between the carbon and the bromine atom. Remember that oftentimes, if you see an oxygen atom that has a lone pair of electrons on it, this is oftentimes going to be a nucleophile in any given reaction. So this is a nucleophile. Similarly, if you see alkenes, because there is a buildup of electron density in those pi orbitals giving us our pi bond, this is also going to be a nucleophile. In the case of alkoxides, which are negatively charged oxygen atoms, either in their ionic form or as an alkoxide by themselves, this is going to be a very strong nucleophile because not only do you have a negative charge, but these lone pairs of electrons, which can be used to attack other atoms or ions. In fact, this carbocation is also a very strong electrophile 
And oftentimes, we're going to encounter reactions where very strong nucleophiles that contain a negative charge will do a nucleophilic attack at carbocation positions because those electrostatic attractions make the ions so incredibly attracted to one another. If you enjoyed it, make sure to like today's video and leave a comment down below if you have any questions at all or want to see any specific topics covered in a future video. Make sure to subscribe to my channel for more chemistry content and I'll see you in the next video.